Hello, welcome. This is our lesson on categorical propositions and what they're made of. That is the components of categorical propositions. Um, this is our first section. We're just starting in this section. This is the first video um, that, I'm, that we're posting here on categorical logic. Categorical logic is really the very first form of logic that was articulated um, thousands of years ago by Aristotle. Uh, of course, there's been changed to some degree, but this is essentially what we're looking at. We'll also be following along. Uh, if you if you have this book, uh, we're going to be following on the 11th edition of Hurley's textbook here, which in his textbook, it's 4.1, the components of categorical propositions. Um, so what we're going to do in this section here is first just sort of uh, explain what it, a categorical proposition is. So that's sort of our first question here is what is a, um, a categorical proposition so what is a categorical proposition exactly well first off uh, we already talked about in an earlier video we discussed the difference between propositions and statements um, a proposition, of course, has to assert something. Now, it's it's an assertion, which means it makes a claim, um, but the claim it makes concerns two different categories. So, if you will, a categorical proposition always involves a category. Excuse me. So, let's think of it like this. And we can symbolize the category by creating circles. We're going to be using here on the side what are known as Venn diagrams. In fact, there's going to be a video a little bit later on in which we'll discuss exactly what Venn diagrams are. But here at this point, don't worry about it. We're just going to say that this circle here symbolizes a category. Now, what can a category be? Well, a category can be anything, right? Um, uh, the ocean can be a category. Um, students can be a category. A category is literally anything. It's an abstract uh, concept. Think of a category as something like a glass here that fills things up. The, um, every category is made up of members. Um, and here again, where I'm going to be using the term category, we can also use the term class sometimes it's referred to. Um, so a categorical proposition asserts things about categories. Um, so for instance, let me give a very simple example. Let's just say that um, dogs are animals, right? Dogs are animals. Now this is, uh, so we'll use this as our example here, dogs are animals. Now, of course, that's a very, very simplistic proposition. And we'll see that it's not technically even in the standard form logical notation that we're going to want you to write them in. Uh, but we'll just take this as our example, dogs are animals. Now, in this example, dogs is its own category, and animals is a second category. There's two different categories. Uh, terms here. Now, every categorical proposition actually has two terms. Uh, and we, we're going to see this within, if we compare categorical propositions to other types of logical systems. Um, other logical systems don't use terms, but rather propositions becomes the central unit. But in categorical logic, um, the term the term within each statement, the two terms within each statement, form, if you will, the sort of atoms that make up a categorical statement. So uh, every uh, categorical proposition has two terms. Now, the first term here is what's known as the subject term. Right? That's the subject term. And animals here is the predicate form, is the predicate term, I'm sorry. So you have the subject term and you have the predicate. Um, now, uh, in this case, we're going to say, uh, to say that all dogs are animals, that means that we're comparing two different categories, in this case, the subject category of dogs and the predicate category of animals. So we can symbolize it like this. Let's, in fact, draw our two circles to overlap in here, where this circle represents dogs and this circle represents animals. Now, this proposition is actually incomplete technically because we're just saying dogs are animals. What we need is we need a quantifier. And we're just going to sort of rewrite this because obviously if I say dogs are animals, what I mean is that all dogs are animals, right? And this is actually this, the correct way of writing this. 
we say all dogs are animals. So let's imagine this, that each one of these circles represents the category of dogs and the category of animals. And this here, this overlapping, this is the place where the two categories, dogs and animals, intersect. So if, for instance, if we could just erase this sort of extra section here, right, just we'll fill that in and assume that there's nothing there, right? So this statement would say that all the dogs, all of the members of the class of dogs are located in here, right? And all of them are within the class of animals, namely all possible dogs are animals, right? So a categorical proposition essentially is any proposition which seeks to, um, uh, which um, explains the relationship between two different categories in terms of whether or not those categories are to be excluded or included universally or particularly, okay? Uh, and if we go over here, we can get some examples here from the textbook of categorical propositions, right? For instance, and none of these are in standard form, right? But you can see, American Idol contestants hope for recognition, right? So in that case, what's the first, ask yourself, what's the first category? What's the subject term? Well, it's American Idol contestants. Now, here you can notice that there's a difference here, is that we're not saying, maybe I should make this even bigger here for you guys to see. Right? If I say American Idol contestants hope for recognition, right? you can see here that this when I say the subject term, uh, the subject term is actually the entire thing here, American Idol contestants. right? Or in this case, junk foods do not belong in school cafeterias. Junk foods right, is, a cat is the subject term, and be not be uh, belonging in school cafeterias is the second category. right? Uh, what's in it here, American Idol contestants, hope for recognition. Hope for recognition is uh, the second category, right? So these are just basic statements that we use all the time in which we're relating different categories together. And here we're saying all American contestants hope for recognition. You're saying, I assume here that all of the members of the class of American Idol contestants are also members of the class of people who hope for recognition, right? And so on and so forth. So, uh, <clears throat> this is the sort of first thing to recognize here about how critical propositions work. Now, let's quickly talk about standard form categorical propositions here. What is a standard form categorical proposition? Let me go down here. Um, standard form propositions. A standard form proposition comes in, there's four different ways to talk about them. Uh, the first thing to recognize is that you can say that um, all members of a class are included in the second class. All members are included, all members of the first class get included in the second class. The second possibility is that all members of one class are excluded from a second class, okay? So this would be, for example, this would be an example of saying all SRP, right? Where S stands for the subject term and P here stands for the predicate term. So the other possibility is you might say that all of the members of a class are excluded. So for instance, if I said no dogs or fish, right? So this would be basically take the form no S or P. Right? All the members are excluded, so they're separate. Uh, for instance, uh, I think that's the type of proposition we had here. In, right here. Let me scroll down. Junk foods do not belong in school cafeterias. Right. This is a case of an exclusionary, exclusionary proposition because it's saying that no junk foods are things that belong in school cafeterias. Right. So that actually takes the form of the second, the, all the members are excluded. Another possibility in terms of how we can relate classes together, the third possibility, is to say that some, but not all members, are included. Right? So this to translate to say some S R P. Okay? So that's to say that some members, but not necessarily all members, are included. For instance, you might say that 
so we might say a statement something like this some human beings are astronauts right and that makes sense because out of all the human beings and all the astronauts in the world right some of the human beings are also astronauts but not all right so some members get included that takes the form of some SRP the fourth possibility here is to say that of course you can probably guess some members get what excluded right some members are excluded but not necessarily all right and that takes the form of some s r not p okay some s are not p so some of the members get excluded right that's the other possible sort of proposition you can say so that'd be for instance to say that um, some people are not bank robbers, for instance, right? Um, some people are bank robbers and some people are not. Now, what does the word some mean? In the context of the, in the context of logic, some means really at least one. So it doesn't mean everyone, but it means at least one member of a specific class. Okay, so what are the standard form propositions to write them more succinctly as we did before? One is to say all S or P. Two, no SRP. Three, right? Some S R um, P. And then finally, number four is to say that some of the S's are not P. And believe it or not, this is actually uh, an exhaustive way of looking at the possible ways in which you can relate two different classes. Okay, now the 4.1 here, the subject of the, this chapter, or this section here, is actually to take a look at what are the components of a categorical proposition. Okay, now there's, so we've already looked at the main two components, which is the subject and the predicate, right? So let's sort of scroll down here. Let's see. So these are the primary components. Oops. Okay, the first, of course, is the subject term. Uh, again, the subject term, now, the subject term here it does not mean the grammatical term of the subject, right? Because if, if we're talking about the, the subject is essentially um, the primary class you're trying to relate it to the other class. So the primary class here isn't the same as the grammatical subject. It is, you have to, this is the difference between just looking at the sentence versus actually understanding the proposition. So there's, of course, the subject term. The, sex pri the second primary component is the predicate term. We'll write that down here for you. Right? The predicate term. Now, the third thing we need to take a look at here, and let's go back up here to our, our, our earlier statement here. Here are our four propositions. All S or P, no S or P, some S or P, some S or not P. Right, so that's what the S and the P are. But what about this? What is this thing called right here? The all, or the no, or the some. What exactly is this? Um, this is known as what's, what we call the quantifier. Right, the quantifier. And the quantifier is the term that we use in a standard form proposition, which tells us how many. How many members of the class are we talking about? Are we talking about universals or particulars, right? Um, <clears throat> so for instance, you have the, uh, yeah, there's either a universal quantifier or there's a particular quantifier. Excuse me. Okay, now of course in our one, if we go above, to say all or no, right? The, both of these are universal, these are universal statements. Right? Because to say all or no here means a universal exclusion. So these are universal quantifiers. Whereas some here, these are particulars, particular statements. Right? So you have some S or P, some S or not P, and these are particular quantifiers. Okay? Now, in, <clears throat> um, and then what's this thing here, this R? This is the, this is the next uh, fundamental element. And this is known as the copula for the copula. Now, what is the copula? The, uh, whoops, there's an L missing. The copula is the binding. What I'm going to, this is not what your book says, but I think this is a helpful way of understanding. It's the binding term. That is, um, the copula is, 
is the term in, within a propositional statement within a categorical proposition that that relates that brings together the subject and the predicate term right um, so that's what the copula is in most cases and pretty much all cases the copula is R right to say that some s are p some s are not p you'll notice the copula is here in each term and the copula st basically um, glues the predicate and the subject together in terms of this, in terms of the quantifier. Okay, so let's go back to our book here and take a look at some examples here. Um, so, right, so consider here's the copula and here's the quantifier, right? So you consider this example. All members of the American Medical Association are people holding degrees from recognized institutions. Okay, so first off, let's analyze what exactly is the quantifier. Well, the quantifier in this, set, in, this, in this statement is all. It's a universal quantifier, right? What's the subject category or the subject class? That's members of the medical association. That's the subject term, right? And then here's our copula, R. And then our predicate term is people holding degrees from recognized academic institutions, okay? So we're saying that there's this one category of American, uh, American Medical Association, people who are in that association, and people who hold degrees from recognized institutions. Well, if all members are in this class, we basically say it exists within it, right? Uh, so that's the, sub, the quantifier, the subject term, and the predicate term. Um, let's see here. Let's see here. This little thing about Ambrose. Um, that's essentially all we're going to do for 4.1 here. What I need you to do is, to, is you'll see that what the exercises are going to ask you to do uh, is basically to read normal statements and then tr see if you can identify uh, the quantifier, the subject, and the predicate terms. Okay, and uh, on top of that, um, you're going to also have to translate ordinary statements into categorical propositions. Now, before I go and leave you here to do your work, um, you'll notice that we talked about, it seems like there's one other element missing in terms of the components of categorical propositions. Let me scroll down here, right? Quantifier, copula, what about, some of you may be saying quantifier, but what about a qualifier how can we don't have a qualifier statement well in here I'm not going to go too much into it because you're going to see that in our next lesson we'll actually explain why there is no qualifier but what would a qualifier be a qualifier would either be something like saying something is the case or saying something is not the case and we're going to see that every categorical proposition does also determine whether or not something is or is not the case by saying all right or by saying um, well, let's go saying something is the case and something saying something is not the case. Let me see if I can give you an example here. Just because I want you to start seeing this because it's sort of critical here. Now, this statement, all S or P, this says something is the case. This is making an assertion, right? Saying no, right? Saying something is not the case, right? This proposition says something is the case and this says something is not the case. Right? So we're going to see that this is actually going to be known as an affirmative. Oops. Why is that doing that? Right, there we, go. we have an affirmative, and this is known as what's as a negative proposition. Okay? This is also an affirmative. And this is a negative. Uh, and this is the what we might call, though we're going to get a little bit more sophisticated here in our next video, we might say that... Uh, this is an affirmative, this is a negative, this is an affirmative, this is a negative. We might say that that's the quality of these propositions. So that's another component I want you to recognize, at least at this immediate step, okay? Um, so that's what a categorical proposition is. That's how it functions. Um, and those are the primary components of it. Now, this is 4.1. Now, what I want you to do in the following homeworks, uh, if you're taking the course with us, right, is first off, I want you to identify the quantifier, the subject term, the copula, and the predicate term for each of these. Uh, and if you're using the aplia, then you can just go and you can complete those exercises in aplia. Okay, that concludes our, 
our first video here. Our next video here will be on 4.2, the quality, the quantity, and the distribution of each of these propositions. Okay, thank you very much.